Hello everyone! Welcome back to another episode of the Wrath of the Righteous Let's Play Shadow Heart Edition. In our last episode, we managed to get all the way through the Great Garrison, only to get knocked aside quite badly by Minago, the evil lady who was essentially going to be a pivotal character for at least a few acts. Um, thankfully, though, we were rescued and are now at the Defender's Heart, a tavern that has kind of sort of been reorganized into a base for the Crusade in their attempt to take back the city. Uh, this episode is going to be completely dialogue, so if that's something that doesn't interest you, feel free to skip it as I put more episodes out. But in the meantime, we're going to get to know all of the main characters, companion-wise, and even recruit a new companion, uh, on that note. Um, as far as where I should start, I mean, you can pretty much just go, you know, clockwise, counterclockwise, it really doesn't matter to me. Um, but yeah, I think we'll just go ahead and just start with Staunton Vane. Why the heck not? Because Staunton Vane is actually going to be a rather interesting character in this act, too. And while I don't have any plans of being the type of, uh, renegade, or, sorry, uh, Eon that helps redeem this guy... I have nonetheless heard that if you play as an Eon, you get a chance at redeeming him, and that can definitely expand his story qualities quite a bit. Okay, so here he is, Staunton Vane. The dwarf resembles an abandoned citadel, one whose high, crumbling walls are still holding fast, but whose empty, lightless windows make it clear that all inside is dead. Oh, it's you! Good work back there, in the Great Garrison, named Staunton Vane. If you've heard rumors about me, his face, which looks like it has never known anything as a carefree as a smile, grimaces. So you know, everything people say about me, it's true. I need to talk to the elf who calls himself the Storyteller. Do you know where I can find him? The Storyteller? Hmm. Staunton strokes his beard and thought. Strange old fellow, that one. He used to sit with me for hours. Asking about all sorts of things. He never offered judgment or comfort, he just listened. At first, I wanted him and his questions as far away from me as possible, but later, I realized that talking to him did ease my burden a little. I hope he's alive and well. He's completely blind and feeble, too, so if he's alone in the city, well, you probably know what that means. I do know one place he might be. Look for him in the Black Wing. It's a library. Here, I'll show you where it is on the map. I don't know how to use a library as a blind elf, but he loved the place. We'd sit there all day and night. My dear, dear little dwarf, if you knew story Storyteller as well as most players do, you'd understand why. But what do people say about you? They say that I'm a traitor, as bad as a Relu Fordlash. That I'm a disgrace, even among the ranks of the condemned. That uh, Queen Godfrey should never have spared me. That I belong in the gallows. Why do they hate you so much? You really don't know? Staunton gives you the long, morose look, then sighs. I'm the reason why the Crusade forces are holed up in a fortress on the edge of the world wound, instead of bringing the fight to the demons. We used to have a foothold in the wound, the mighty, unassailable city of Dresden. We used to have it until it fell. And all because of my stupidity. I gave the enemy our main citadel. I was tried. They wanted to execute me. And rightly so. But the queen intervened. She said that I should live and fight in order to undo what I have done. So that's how I live. Decade after decade. Fighting in the contempt. The dwarf shrugs. As you can see, I have fixed nothing. And I have earned no one's forgiveness. Are you going to spit in my face, too? Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I am. <laughs> the dwarf casually wipes his face. He looks at you calmly, as though nothing happened. A whole city fell because of you? How is that possible? What do you mean, how? The knife... The knight glares at you from his, beneath his furrowed brows. If you don't trust the word of a condemned, go ask somebody else. 
like my little brother Jordan. And if you still don't believe it, what's it to me? But if you're about to ask me to recount the story of my disgrace for the thousandth time, don't. You really don't have any friends? I could not have survived this long if I were completely alone. Jordan, my little brother, he keeps me going. He's never once abandoned me. Everyone else shies away from me, like they might catch what I've got. Even fighters in the Condemned console themselves by thinking, I got stripped of my rank, but at least I'm not stunting. Commander Tirapade seems to be the only person in the whole army who remembers that I'm a soldier and not a drudge. She has no qualms about taking me in the battle. She's had some mud flung at her in the past, or so I hear. That's why she tries to keep an open mind about people. It's no surprise that she's the only one to hold on to her sense of reason and farce. So many years in the Condemned. Surely you've paid your penance by now. It's not up to me to decide. My life is in the Queen's hands. He falls silent for a moment, and then in a trembling voice he adds, The Condemned isn't the worst part. All these years I've prayed to Torad for forgiveness. Countless times I've gone to his priest, countless times I've kneeled before his altar. If only the father of dwarven kind would answer my prayers just once. Not to restore what I've lost, but just tell me, I'm still one of his children. But it seems he doesn't give a damn about me. What can I expect from mere mortals, when my own god doesn't think I deserve redemption? I have to go. Oh, yeah. Go on then. Maybe we'll see each other again. Foreshadowing! <laughs> uh, okay, so next, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to Camellia, just because she's as close as she is. Camellia looks over you over pensively, toying with the snake-shaped bone amulet that dangles from her pale neck. Noticing your glance, she flashes you a cold, barely there smile. Greetings. It seems for a moment that she wants to say something else, but the pause grows too long, and she slips back into cautious silence. Tell me about yourself. You want to know more about me than you already do? Why? Camellia arches a dainty brow. I talk to the spirits of this tormented land, and they guide me in battle. I'll help you fight the demons, and I swear that you can rely on me in this matter. Isn't that sufficient? Where'd you learn to wield a reaper so well? I had good teachers, although they don't get all the credit. I am a most diligent student. Camilla licks her parched lips. Your amulet is quite unusual. Where did you get it? Ah, my little trinket. It's so nice of you to notice. But I assure you this amulet is nothing but a bauble. Can a lady not be drawn to beautiful, useless things? You're much more relaxed during combat. Your battle cries are... Uh, uninhibited. She blushes slightly and lowers her eyes. So you've noticed? To be honest, I find it embarrassing. You see, being a shaman means having the spirits of battle as my ever-present companions. In the heat of combat, they become rather... Uh... Vocal. Anyway, as much as I enjoy our delightful conversations, the spirits are calling me, and I must respond. Please, excuse me. Camellia turns away, watching me out of the corner of her eye. I smell bullshit and that excuse, but we can talk to her again later. Actually, you can just talk to her right now if you want, but I think I'll indulge her for a little bit. Okay. Next up is... Ah, yes, this little bunch right here. Visali Rathamus. Not super amazing in his own right, but he is a very helpful uh, squirrelvin. A stout old man with a fuzzy gray beard mumbles a prayer. He looks as tired as everyone else in the tavern, but determination is stamped upon his haggard face. What can I do for you? Who are you? Visali Rathamus, rector of the local temple of Abadar. The temple is gone, though, and if we snooze here for much longer, the city will be lost as well. Who's that boy with you? This one? Kyado, the shepherd, my apprentice. He's a smart boy, and his faith is strong. He serves Aristil, though, but there's still something he can learn from the old servant of Abadar. He'll be a great cleric when he gets a little older. What kind of help can I expect from you? First, I sell scrolls. I have a lot of them. Something for every emergency. Second, while you're here in a tavern, I can read one for you. Guaranteed, no surprises. But you better not go into the city without a cleric. I won't be going there myself. I'm 
too old and my powers are needed here. Hmm, I'm partial cleric, so that works for me. Show me the scrolls you're selling. You get a lot of scrolls. Like, tons of scrolls. Hell, you even get freaking raised dead. That's... <laughs> that is a... Woo! A lot. Um... Let's see here. I don't have quite the money for everything. Let's see. I'm six. Well, well, that's not very much. Um. Now, while we're here, I did get the uh, special items that you get if you get a certain version of this. You bought a certain version of this game. Uh, and I'll go over them real quick. We have the Dashing Cavalier's Gloves. These gloves grant their wearer a plus one morale bonus on attack rolls. In addition, they also grant a plus two bonus on damage rolls while mounted. Pretty much a really uh, handy dandy hand item, <laughs> as you could say. <laughs> and really, uh, for anybody who rides a mount of any sort. So, Sea Luck could definitely get some use out of these. Next is a magnificent plume hat. This hat grants this wearer a plus five bonus to maximum hit points. Not particularly useful, at least not throughout the entire game, but for the tankier people among your party, it's still very helpful. Uh, and then there's the Righteous Exorcist Bracers, which grant their wearer a plus one morale bonus on damage rolls against demons. There's a lot of demons in the game, and that's certainly helpful in the early game. Especially if you put them on a character who can do a lot of damage to begin with. <laughs> and then last but not least, the Rat Catcher's Goggles. These goggles grant their wearers a plus two bonus on damage rolls against swarms. Swarms, unfortunately, are not that prevalent in the game, at least not outside the city. But even for the few that you see, um, what's awesome is that anything that can damage uh, swarms will get uh, a bonus from the rat catcher's goggles, whether it's a spell or a grenade or whatever. So that's that's really, really, really useful, at least for a little while. Not for the entire game, but hey, not a big deal. Personally, I get I hate dealing with swarms in Pathfinder games anyway, so especially on the higher difficulty levels where they really ramp up their defenses against like just basic weapons. Uh here's Gyaldo. Let's go ahead and talk with him. I believe that help is already on the way. The Queen will not leave us to die. Yeah, he's kind of a <laughs> nervous wreck of sorts. Not a big deal. Okay, and look over here, our second party member, Lan. <coughs> Lan greets you with a nod. Here for a chat? I've been waiting for you to come and see what strange beast is taking in your party. I'd like to know more about you. Let me guess, your first question is, can you wear a hat with one horn? Am I right? You speak common much better than the rest of your tribe. Funnily enough, common isn't all that common underground, Lan says. But your observation is correct. I used to live on the surface with my parents for a while and had a chance to learn a couple things. The language and the fact that every peasant who sees me sees my scaling mug screams DEMON and runs away. I don't know if you're interested, but my mom wasn't from an underground tribe. She was a smuggler, the kind that used the dungeons of cadavers to secretly move and store goods. One time, two gangs couldn't agree on how to share a prime cut, got into a fight, and the winners threw the losers down a hole. Dead and living alike. My dad went to check if the corpses had anything useful in them, and he found a girl from the surface, barely clinging to life. An incredible feeling sparked between them. Or maybe the girl just liked men with scales and a cat nose. That might be it. One way or another, he got her back on her feet, and he later even left his home caves. She left her smuggling behind, and they began an honest life together. That's the delightful story of how old land came into this world. The next chapter, however... Well, my family and I never stayed in one place for long. We lived sometimes on the surface, sometimes underground. We couldn't find a place to call home. Living in the caves was hard on my mom, and my dad's appearance raised too many questions in Mendev. They're at war against the demons, after all. In the end, my parents decided to stop making each other miserable and separated. My father and I returned to our tribe. I think the peasants screaming, DEMON, had something to do with it. Or maybe dad just couldn't stand life without rat tail soup. I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Did you come with me so you could see the surface again? I... No, that wasn't it. I just don't have much patience for certain types of creatures. Demons, I mean. They want to destroy Canabras. I'll be on the side of the people they're attacking. Land looks away. I don't like it when my subordinates hide things from me. Land doesn't seem bothered by the threat. He shrugs. It's not a secret or anything. 
just some private emotions and things that don't matter to anyone besides me. But if you want to listen, be my guest. My birth, hell take me, turned out to be a great misfortune for my parents, all because I'm relatively healthy. I'm the best thing that can come from a marriage between a cave-dwelling mongrel and anyone from the surface. A healthy child with the right number of hands and feet, no apparent defects, no missing organs or other problems. They saw hope in me, so risked having more children. They somehow thought they thought it would somehow be all right. A growl edged into Land's voice. I could have had four brothers. The first was born two years after me and died three years later. He didn't have a nose. Nothing even remotely resembling one. He could only breathe through his mouth. Mom and Dad were afraid to take their eyes off him for fear he'd choke and suffocate on something. But in the end, it was his weak heart that killed him. Then there was another pregnancy. And birth. I pretended I was sleeping, but snuck out of my bedroom and listened under the door. All those hours. It was very strange, but I never heard the newborn screaming. Mom moaning. Yes, the priest's praying. And I dared to open the door a little and looked inside. The priest stood there, very pale. One of them was holding something, a small object that fit in his palm. He asked, Do you know what this is? And the other said, I think it's a head. Land stops. Very moving, but would you like to get to the point? That was the point. You asked me what made me follow you to the surface. I'll tell you. Land pauses, exhales, and continues in a steadier voice. It turned out that this time, Mom was expecting triplets. The first of the babies was born in pieces, and the two others didn't live long enough to draw the first breath. About three weeks later, my father took me to the caves. He didn't want to leave. I could see it in his face, but I think my mom and he decided it together. The curse my people had carried since the first crusade stood between them, not to mention the four dead babies. And old age was rapidly taking its toll on my father. After we returned to the cave, he only lived another four years. So, if you're asking me why I decided to go up with you to the surface and join the Crusaders, well, the answer is I've always wanted to. I was afraid to leave my tribe, but it always haunted me that I'd die in a world where four Crusades could do nothing to stop the beast from the abyss, and the number of victims kept growing. I want to change that. Or at least try to. And if change, changing things is too much to ask, then at least get a little revenge. The ones who are behind the world wound owe me a great debt. The lives of four brothers, all my mother's tears, my father's broken heart, is a lot. So much that killing a couple of demons won't do it for me. I want to do something real, and I'm ready to pay any price. Call it my personal crusade if you like. Land gives you a slanted grin. I used to think that things would be better if I'd never been born, but now I think I was born for this. To settle the score. Why didn't you go up and join the Crusades before? I couldn't just abandon my tribe. I'm their best hunter. I'll have it much harder without me. But now that the demons have nearly destroyed Canabras and the caves almost collapsed on our heads, sitting and waiting it out just wasn't an option anymore. Anyway, I'm more useful up here than I am down there. Plus, the chief let me go, which means my death of the tribe has been paid. Would you like to find your mother? No. The word flies from Lance's mouth faster than narrow. Then after a pause, he continues. I don't want to meet her. Not because I feel any resentment. It's just that she's a half elf. She barely fought, got her first gray hair, and I'll be a ramshackle old man. She's buried enough, children. There's no need to make her witness the death of another one. I hope you understand. I'm very sorry, truly. Lance smiles. This time, sadly. Well then, I am very lucky. I met someone who not only helped me choose the right path, but is happy to listen to my whining. And then here's a line I've actually never seen before, mainly because I've never tried to romance land, but I think I'm actually going to shoot for it in this one. Of course, I've got a mod that lets me romance whoever the hell I want, so I've still got the queen in my sights, but that's really more for... I'm curious to see if it affects uh, corrupting her uh, when I become a devil in the future. We'll have to see. Your parents' love didn't survive hardship, but that doesn't mean the same thing will happen to you. What if you find true love, someone who won't leave you no matter what? And break my beloved's heart when I die in her arms five years later? That's a fine thing to do to the person you love. 
Been a teen again, there's a chance I'll inspire some tragic bard to write a tearful ballad. Thanks for sharing, Lan. Thanks for listening. Let's see, I think this... Well, you know what, I'll read this. I wish there was something worth hearing. Well, alright. My mom was a smuggler from the service, and my dad was one of the then chief scouts. After they met, they'd have to live on the move. Cave life was especially hard on my mom, and dad was often mistaken for a demon spy when we lived above ground. After all, Mindev is under the constant threat of invasion from the world wound. My parents' marriage fell apart in the end. It was the constant anxiety, the inability to find a home, and mostly because of my brother's deaths. Nature itself was against their union, or not nature, but rather the curse that my blood carries. Out of all their children, I was the only one born relatively healthy. The triplets died at birth, and my younger brother lived for only three years. That's regular life for us. Every new generation of mongrels has new mutations, and many of them are fatal or leave you crippled. Many parents in the tribe don't name their children until they're at least three. My mom couldn't stand it in the end and left my father and me to go back to normal life on the surface. Spent most of my uh, adult life in the tribe, but I always wanted to leave and join the Crusaders. The life of Mongrel is short, and I'd like to spend mine doing something meaningful. To play my part in fighting the world wound or helping those who suffered it from the team car. That's my story. Pretty much an abridged version of what he said earlier, so I might cut it in the edit. Mongrels have short lifespans, but you don't look like you're getting old or dying. How old are you? <laughs> I'm as old as I look! No surprises there. But remember Sol? He's ten years older than me. I remember him back when he was a fearless warrior, and day by day, I watched him turn into an old man. Him and my father. It happens very quickly. First, you miss a shot because you don't see the target as clearly as you used to. You think it's because your eyes are tired. You tell yourself it'll get better tomorrow. Then you notice you're having trouble breathing, that climbing is harder than before. Land clenches and unclenches his human fists. Your fingers stop bending. You have to tie your sword to your hands. You can't even put on your greaves without help. When you're washing your face in a stream, sometimes you catch sight of a gray-haired, wrinkled old man you don't recognize. And this goes on until one day, you come across a cave beast, and you realize you can't outrun it. Land takes a breath. My dad kept diaries, marking all the signs, and I saw it too. The last year, I had to help him get out of bed, help him dress, remind him to eat. Sometimes he forgot my name. I told him that we should have stayed on the surface, and he joked that dodging a goddess was behavior unworthy of a crusader. He meant for asthma. Every morning I wake up and check how I feel, but there are no signs yet. Even so, I know I don't have much time. I need to do something useful before I forget why I came here. I want to talk about Windowog. Are you sure? Ugh, alright. Tell me about your connection to Windowog. My connection to Windowog? <laughs> I mean, where do I start? Land turns to the inexpressive reptile half of his face to you. We grew up together, trained together. She was the chief's daughter. She was groomed to be the best all her life, and then I came along. We were rivals, but we dragged each other out of tight spots, too. I've always been drawn to grand heroic gestures, sometimes idiotic ones, whereas one do like to roam and explore passages, finding new caves, and making maps. She wanted to be a great huntress, the one who'd make it through the maze, through the shield maze. But instead, she... Land shakes his head. It'd be better if she died. The death of a friend is painful, but watching a friend become a shadow of their former self is... unbearable. She doesn't think she's a shadow of her former self. Of course! She thinks she did everything right, because the second she starts to doubt herself, she'll have to face the truth. To admit she's just a cannibal that demons use as they wish. Lance frowns looks almost like a wince. She wants to get stronger and stronger, but for what? I'll never understand what drives her. Were you just friends, or were you more than that? Wow, <laughs> you really don't pull your punches, do you? Lan exhales loudly. There was a time when I asked myself the same question. Wonderwog knew me better than anyone, she understood me better than anyone. She was my first woman. But we never loved each other. Maybe I could have grown to love her, but it always seemed like she never understood what love was. Maybe she just wasn't capable of those kinds of feelings. It's too bad you and Wonderwog didn't work out, but there are plenty of other women around who might like you. Me, for example. Land laughs, and by coincidence, turns the inexpressive scaly side of his face towards you. 
Don't joke like that. I almost believed you. A humble guy like me? A beautiful woman could have me wrapped around her little finger without even trying. Thanks. I found out everything I wanted to know. I don't want to reopen any more of my old wounds. You know where to find me. So! Can you wear your hat with one horn? Sure I can, but certain designs don't suit me too well. Lance speaks in a deadly serious voice. Found out everything I want to know. Thank you. Sure thing. Tell me about your people. Of course. What would you like to know? What's it like living in your caves? Oh! Land gives you a broad smile. The smile strains as if it falters where his human features meet his animals. Imagine that in the entire world, there's only a few hundred like you. There's not an inch of fertile ground anywhere. Nowhere to grow grain for bread, for cotton, and linen for cloth. Your neighbors are beasts who want to eat you, or parasites who want to infect you with their larvae, and then eat you. And it's not that bad, because you can try to eat most of the things that are trying to eat you. Sometimes at the risk of getting poisoned, sometimes with almost no risk at all. In worse years, there's not a single living thing anywhere to be found. Predator or prey. That's when you eat mushroom soup. I'd say three times a day, but then it was barely enough for one for three days. Glenn shrugs. But life underground has its upsides, pun intended. There's no risk of losing the roof over your head, there's no bad weather, not counting the earthquakes, of course. Are you really the descendants of the First Crusaders? More like demon spawn, aren't we? <laughs> Sad, but true. Without the demons, there would be no mongrels. It's the magic of the world wound that affected our ancestors and made their children the way we are. Like most of our tribe, Chief Saul fancies himself a descendant of the underground crusaders. The ones our heroic ancestors left to guard the caves. I don't know if it's true or not. That angel came to our cave for a reason. Maybe he remembered us. Those were evil and dangerous times after the First Crusade. Hundreds of Crusaders began having children, and the babies were born with fangs and horns and warts that covered half their face. People didn't like the new look. The Inquisitors sure didn't. So our ancestors fled persecution and made a home for themselves down there under the ground. They probably intended to find a cure for their children and hoped to return in time, but it never happened. Instead, the World Wound's terrible legacy was passed down from generation to generation. Mongrel parents can only guess what their child will look like. Each of us was born with a new mutation. Many mutations are fatal. Land stops, then goes on quietly. Down in the caves, we usually don't congratulate the family for the birth of a child until they turn at least three. Most don't even get a name before that. There's no point. It hasn't been that long since the First Crusade. What do you know so? Why do you know so little about your ancestors? Our lives are much shorter than most uplanders. Pure, only a few generations passed, and many still live who remember old Sarkoris as it stood untouched by the demons. Queen Gawfrey, for example. But where we live, Mongols start getting old much earlier than humans, much faster, and with more devastating consequences. Few live past 40, and fewer still live long enough to die of old age. Hunger, hunger disease, and monsters from the deep are more effective killers than time. So for us, the story of the First Crusade is a legend that happened generations ago. There are no living witnesses. We have a tale of the wise and great ancestors who left us to stand guard in the catacombs, but in reality I suspect they were desperate wretches who couldn't figure out how to dispel the demonic plague and who were effect abandoned by their own kind. Do you have a way to tell day and night? You can't see the sun in your caves. Every mongrel settlement has a big gong, which we treat like a relic. The gong keeper hits it twice a day to mark the beginning and end. But this custom doesn't keep time very precisely. Every mongrel child has snuck up to the gong to strike it at the wrong time at least once just out of pure mischief. Nothing could keep me away from it, not even the fact that I only have one ear, which means it would take double the punishment once I was caught. So sometimes the wrong strikes get mixed in with the right ones, and the tribe can find itself jumping up to beat the morning in the middle of the night. Do mongrel tribes fight each other? There were some skirmishes, and I've been forced to kill my kinfolk folk before, too. Land speaks in a steady voice. Fights most often break out over food. We have laws in the caves, written and unwritten rules that we follow. We respect one another's right to live. But hunger? It can push a person over the edge. I've never, never, you can count on that, stolen someone else's kill. But I can understand those of my kin who tried. 
to hear your kids begging for food and not being able to feed them is terrifying. He frowns and goes silent. You're the only member of the Neathholm tribe to call your people mongries. Why is that? Uh, because all of Galarian calls us that? I don't see the point of all this hemming and hawing over what we're called. Anyone who finds it offensive or takes issue with it can lead the charge against the name. No one's stopping them. But personally, I'm not going to pick a fight over something as unimportant as a name. Thank you, I found out everything I want to know. Nice to know my rambling seemed useful to somebody. <clears throat> what do you think of life on the surface? It must be very different from life underground. Of course, as far as living conditions, the surface is definitely a better place to be. It's easier to get good food and water, not to mention build a house, and even grow a few things. In older, well-established settlements, you don't have to deal with anything scarier than rats or maybe foxes stealing chickens. As for the kind of life you have, I read a story about demon worshippers abducting a whole family and sacrificing them one by one while the others watched. But there were some brave crusader knights nearby, and they killed the villains and saved everyone. And I heard another story. A young blacksmith lost his arm in a fire, couldn't work to feed his wife and baby. They tried their best and lived from hand to mouth, but they were still destitute. In the end, the desperate blacksmith robbed a traveler one night on the road. But there were some brave crusader knights nearby, and they caught the robber and threw him in prison. Not long after, his wife smothered their baby and hanged herself. This game does not pull any punches, and I love it for that, morbid as it might sound. Up here, the same person can proudly say he's protecting the innocent from demons, and then look the other way around, while the same innocent starves just because they were born into a poor family. Queen Galfrey prolongs her life with sun orchid elixirs that cost enough to feed an entire city. Back in our caves, everyone is equally poor, and if one person starves, the whole tribe starves. We don't abandon our own in times of trouble. That's the power of a tribe. The laws of the surface are made so that some get everything and others get nothing. It might just be a naive fool from the caves, but I don't understand how it's possible to have so much more and share so much less. Lan, oh my god, you know the, our real world so freaking well, it's almost scary. That's how good the writing is in this game, by the way. Anyway, look what I'm talking to. You must know life on the surface much better than I do. <clears throat> We're in a struggle for our very survival against the Abyss. This is no time to upend society in a quest for fairness. So, you think if the world wound hadn't happened, the surface would have had already changed for the better? I'm not so sure. I'm not even sure my kinsfolk would find their way to inventing their own aristocracy if they ever got their hands on anything viable enough to divide unfairly. But, what's the point of being prince of all caves, holes, and gorges if your only throne is a boulder and your only crown is made of rat skulls? You said you were prepared to risk your life to do something meaningful. What exactly did you mean? To invent a new salad and have it named after me. <laughs> Lan remarks grimly, and he sighs. Truth be told, I don't know. It would be much easier if all I really wanted was to kill demons, then a few more demons, then more demons after that! Good honest rage and no needless brooding. I think I actually envy the warriors who can live like that. I think you and Staunton ought to go out of a drink then. But I can't. If life's taught me one thing, it's that there are no easy choices. Dying a glorious death isn't enough. Some heroes of the Crusade did that and also saved entire settlements, erected the ward stones. Their actions kept the lands of Mendev safe for decades. That's what I want. For my dumb short life to have meant something. You think I have an exaggerated opinion of myself? Some scaly freak crawls out of the caves and wants to take control of the Wardstone and flaunt Iomade's banner. Any fool can charge at the front lines of the demonic armies and die there, but what good will that do? I want something meaningful, you know? Even if I have to pay the highest price, especially if I have to pay it, there are plenty of worthier people who need to survive this war and tell everyone else what nutcases we want. Thank you for your answers. So long! Eh, no leaving text. He does love the fireplace, though. I think that's one thing I love the most about Lan and why I'm kind of attached to him as a companion. I do wish I would hang with Windwog more because she's, like, this massively different character. Um, I can watch that through Slandard's gameplay, of course, but 
just love how Leia is written. And I especially love the work they did with the Mongols. Coming up with a whole new type of uh, race in the game was just really fun. And they even got their own stat adjustments to boot, which I thought was really cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's talk to Sila next. Sila smiles at you warmly. Hey there! During that march through the dungeon, we never got a chance to exchange a proper greeting. It's high time I shake your hand. I'd like to know more about you. Of course! Ask anything and I'll answer honestly. Tell me about yourself. Where are you from? I'm a little bit from Geb, a little bit from Katapesh, but mostly from the Knights of Nyoma Day. I was accepted and began my training at 14. I belong to their ranks more than I belong to any other place. You come to Mindev by a long road, haven't you? A very long one, Seal looks at you cheerfully. A traveler is expected to have amusing stories. Unfortunately, I have only three tales of any interest, and I'd like to save them for our next beast. Otherwise, I won't have anything to show for myself when it's time to start bragging. And that just won't do, especially since I'll win the night with my cautionary tale of a battle with chupacabras. Isn't your attitude towards life and war too carefree, especially for a paladin? Was that an answer for approach? If you're only just asking, then no. I don't think so. You have to know when it's time for jokes and when it's time for mourning. The right moment for joys and for sermons, and sometimes a good traveling story can be all those things, if it entertains and purifies the soul. That story about the Chupacabras is one of the good ones. Picture a small town in Kadira, and down in the dungeon there's two murderers waiting to be executed. Gallows are already built for them, the ropes have been bought, but sometimes life takes a surprising turn. Suddenly, a paladin of Iomade appears in the doorway and offers the murderers a deal. If they go with her to fight some monsters, they'll live. If they survive, that is. There's a big difference between imminent death and probable death with a glimmer of hope, wouldn't you say? So here we are traveling through the desert. Me and my friend, a priestess of Saren Ray, along with the little rat folk who ask for her help. And the two cutthroats. We get to the rat folk village and see their bodies lying around all drained dry. We figured we'd have to fight vampires. That's how the little rat folk describe the monsters who attack their village. That's why we went in all brazen-like. The sun was high, and the vampires couldn't attack until dusk. But we never got a chance to look around. Black shadows, quick as the wind, attacked from all sides. Not vampires, but chupacabras. One of the lads we pulled from the gallows got killed right away. The second one ran for his life. That left me, the rat folk, and Kira, that was the name of the priestess, and we all steeled ourselves for the fight of our lives. And just when we thought the end had come, with the trooper coppers surrounding me like a pack of dogs around a bear, our rat folk friend wound it down, uh, wounded and down, and the teeth of the quickest of those blasted monsters clenched on Kira's shoulder. Right then, when all hope was lost, the other lad from the gallows suddenly comes running back. He kills the beast attacking Kira. I am sure you know what a turning point in a fight looks like. Well, this was it. A moment before, we were lost, and a moment later, we had it back under control. The trooper coppers dropped dead, one by one. The little rat folk is reunited with his family, who are hiding in the basement. The priestess and I closed the eyes of that boy from the gallows who saved us. It was a shame he didn't survive the fight. May the gods keep his soul and journey through the afterlife. Your savior was a fool. He could have easily have fled. If he was a fool, I like that sort of foolishness more than cold, merciless calculation. Had it not been for that mercy, Milos, that was his name, would be hanging from a noose and me, Kira, and all the rat folk would be dead in that village. Someone told me that a kind deed done by an unkind person is a hundred times more precious. By the same token, an evil done by a noble soul is a hundred times more horrifying. That's what I really wanted to say. The trooper coppers were just a good starting point. What made you become a paladin of Iomade? Sila's gaze sharpens momentarily, then she sighs. That's a serious question, and a good one. You should ask a bit of your companions, but it's a long story. To start with, 12 years ago, I was nothing like the person I am now. I roamed the streets of Solku with the other homeless orphans. I stole, I fought, I was a hired sword for a bit. Not the proper origins for a paladin, isn't it? Back then, Solku was a city of orphans, widows, and widowers. Knolls decimated the city regularly. My parents were among their victims. People there heard about new deaths before they finished mourning their previous losses. One day, a group of Knights of Iomade brought a glimmer of hope to the city. 
But while others saw them as saviors and protectors, I was busy pricing up the noble horses and their gleaming mithril armor, wondering just how much one of those pretty swords would fetch. <laughs> a thief lives one day at a time. That's what they say. I was the type that never thought past the next job. Anyhow, I was able to sneak into the knight's camp and steal one of their mithril helms. See those pauses, her voice sad and measured. And I was right there when Enol attacked the helm's owner. Asemi was her name, and dealt a blow to her unprotected head. A knoll, like all those others, she fearlessly driven from the gates of Soku. That one blow was fatal, but who was really to blame for her death? The knoll attacker, or the young thief named Sila. Even a seemingly small misdeed can have terrible consequences. Yes, you're right a thousand times over. I hate to say it, but I just didn't see it back then. And if I had never gotten that lesson, my eyes would probably never have been opened. Who knows what would have happened to me if it wasn't for a Simeon of her bravery. And her death? Maybe the world would know Sila as a bandit, not as a knight and protector of those in need. That's a saying I like to remember. People rarely find redemption on their own. Someone must show them the way. But you are asking what brought me into the ranks of Iomedes warriors. Well, we all choose a paladin's path for our own reasons. Some are guided by nobility of spirit, some by a desire to fight justice. I became who I am through penance and a debt unpaid. The day Asimi died protecting my city, I wanted to kill myself for the terrible guilt I felt. But then I realized it wouldn't make the world any better. And I decided that instead, of, instead I'd try to take her place. I'd become who she'd been and protect the innocence that she would no longer be able to protect. What are the principles that Paladin to Biamide follow? Sila smiles. I'll tell ya. I like to recite her code. It feels like I've said it a thousand times, but it never gets old. There's strength in these words. After a pause, she begins, her voice slow and meditative. I will learn the weight of my sword. Without my heart to guide it, it is worthless. My strength is not in my sword, but in my heart. If I lose my sword, I have lost a tool. If I betray my heart, I have died. I will have faith in the Inheritor. I will channel her strength through my body. I will shine in her legion, and I will not tarnish her glory through base actions. I am the first in the battle, and the last to leave it. I will not be taken prisoner by my free will. I will not surrender those under my command. I will never abandon a companion, though I will honor sacrifice freely given. I will guard the honor of my fellows, both thought and deed, and I will have faith in them. When, I, when in doubt, I may force my enemies to surrender, but I am responsible for their lives. I will never refuse a challenge from an equal. I will give honor to worthy enemies and contempt to the rest. I will suffer death before dishonor. I will be temperate in my actions and moderate in my behavior. I will strive to emulate Iomedes' perfection. Thank you. I've learned everything I want to know. I hope I didn't bore you. Ask me something else if you like. Irabeth said your friend Jana Aldori is missing. Do you know where we should look for her? Irabeth is worried about her fighters. I understand that. I wanted to look for Jana myself, so I didn't distract you, but since you're in this too, I could use some help. Jana and I met in Canabras a few days ago and just hit it off. We went drinking together. We went to an unforgettable celebration together too, but we got separated in the crowd. So, we should start looking from the main square. That's where I last saw her. Sila frowns. Janna's a good fighter, even if she is green. She couldn't have become an Aldori otherwise. I, I hope that means she's alright. What do you think of what's going on in Canabras? It's complete chaos. It's lucky we were here to handle it, right? Sila smiles brightly. Then she gives you a worried look. Does the way I talk bother you? I know I can seem... Blase. Many good people and our protector Terendola have died here in Canabras. The paladin of Naomade is expected to be properly respectful and solemn. But I prefer to face my troubles with a smile and a bit of common sense. Grief is a weapon they'll use against you. It can undermine a warrior's spirit. It's better it's better we hold off on grief until we've driven the last demon and killed us from the city. There's wisdom in the traditions of mourning, and one shouldn't reject them. All the more so if an appropriate merriment could offend other mourners. Many people's loved ones perish in Canabras. <laughs> yeah, you may be right. I should keep myself in check more. Better discipline, more self-control, quality suited to a paladin. 
Is fighting demons all you want, or are you looking for something more? How about covering myself in glory and becoming the hero of a hundred ballads? Or at least a dozen. Yeah, they're lively ones. Sila's eyes shine cheerfully. Anyway, to be more serious, the area around the world wound is the best place for a paladin who wishes to defend the weak and serve good. Being part of the crusade is a war reward enough for me. But there's something that worries me. I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing my brothers in arms, but the Eagle Watch and the other orders are focused on just one aim. The war against world wound. That's why they can sometimes overlook the smaller things. Ordinary misfortunes, you know. I always like being a wandering knight because any moment I could get up and go help a, help a poor rat folk whose family had been kidnapped. Or an old woman whose favorite dog had gone missing. So here's my answer. I don't have some big important goal, but I'll be happy to help those who need it. A little bit here and there. Thanks for speaking with me. Until next time. See the smiles. See ya! Alright, now we'll talk to... We'll save Irabeth for later because she's connected to a quest I can pick up in the basement. From here, we'll talk to Hylor. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. I kind of like to pronounce that the way. That's just how I am. A tall, athletic man greets you. Also, he's one of the few NPCs that has his own portrait. His hair is prematurely gray and shorn close to his head in a military style. He's lean and well-groomed, and a monocle twinkles coldly in his eye. His uh, picture doesn't have a monocle on it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! Maybe that's why we can't pick his picture out in the character select screen. The bull set of his jaw and his large but agile frame attests that here is a man who is always ready to be on the move. Greetings, I am Hylor, Venture Captain of the Pathfinder Society. I am the superior officer among Pathfinders in this region of Mindev. However, the Society is running almost no operations here right now. Besides me, there are almost no Pathfinders here. Actually, I'm only stuck here because of an old feud with a demon worshiper known as the Spinner of Nightmares. I've had to work alone without the support of the Society, but I've made a lot of acquaintances among the local mercenaries and daring fighters. If you need any good fighters for an honest cause, talk to me. Here is, of course, the guy who can let you make mercenaries. And, quite surprisingly to me at least, this guy actually does have a quest. The Spinner of Nightmares is a thing. I unfortunately did not beat it the first time I uh, played this game, but I would definitely like to try pushing for it harder next time. Whoops. Um, I don't know how far you can go with that with a guy who's going to go down a devil mythic path, but hey, any solution works for me. Tell me about your confrontation with the Spinner of Nightmares. It all began with the task of the Pathfinder Society. I arrived in Nerosian with my team to investigate the sudden death of a famous crusader, Baron Falren. We soon focused in on a small hospital for the wealthy, where our following was being treated shortly before his death. Turned out that a gang of Baphomet's cultists, calling themselves the Labyrinth of Mind, had gotten a foothold at the hospital. They were obsessed with twisting the minds of their victims and targeted fragile people, too weak to resist. The hospital was filled with perfect victims, isolated for weeks from the outside world, completely helpless. And when they returned, they were different. Almost normal, but the moment they heard a certain phrase, something dark awoke in their minds, and they transformed into servants of Baphomet, ready to lie, betray, and even kill. The Labyrinth of Mind was preparing to infiltrate all the elite circles in Mindev, but Baron Falren stopped them. He was too loyal to his oath, and too resistant to their spells. He fought for his freedom under the strain, until the strain broke his heart. We opened and cleaned the city of Baphomet's pit of vipers. Their den was a cradle of sin and filth. They cast spells on each other, and their loathsome fan fantasies stepped real from their minds into the world. They dreamt of horrible and forbidden things, and they fought like mad. We burned the place to the ground and slaughtered everyone we could. But the leaders of the cult were able to flee, and they were set up and they were set upon revenge. They abducted my daughter Lori, who served under my command in the Pathfinder Society. They left me a note full of tart insults, mockery, and sneers. From that note, I learned the name of my enemy. The Spinner of Nightmares. A few months later, I confirmed that she was the leader of the Labyrinth of Mind. My hunt had begun. I would get Lori back at any cost. Hylor grits his teeth with bulldog determination. I want to know, Boromar, about you. What exactly are you interested in? I'm a common pathfinder. There are many others like me. Fate, my order, brought me to this land. How'd you end up here? I was working on an assignment for the Pathfinder Society, and then... A demon worshiper named the Spinner of Nightmares abducted my daughter Lori. For the past three years, I've been trying to save her. 
During this time, I've become a specialist in scouting demon territory. I've even planted agents among the cultists. Truth be told, in pursuing the Spinner of Nightmares, I've been acting more on behalf of Queen Godfrey than the Pathfinder Society. It's a long story. Maybe I'll tell you the rest of it sometime. Hi, Lord frowns grimly. Spinner of Nightmares is a true spawn of the Abyss. I've bought her many times, but I've never been able to seize her by the throat. Tell me about your daughter. High Laura smiles, showing his healthy white teeth. As a girl, Lori was just an angel. We lost her mother early on. She was left to follow my example. A drifter with little idea how to t talk to a ten-year-old girl. But even with such questionable parenting, Lori managed to grow into a wonderful girl. Brave, smart, beautiful, and entirely unbearable. She's always arguing... <laughs> She's always argued with me about everything. When Lori was 18 and told me she was going to be a Pathfinder, all I said was, All right. I knew there was no use to try to talk her out of it. And she was a fine Pathfinder. I know his fists clenched with a painful sounding crack. I'll never forgive the spinner of nightmares for taking my girl from me. Tell me about the Pathfinder Society. The Pathfinder Society is a global organization that unites opportunists and adventurers of all kinds. We explore the world and uncover its secrets, travel, and sometimes face down threats. In times of trouble, the latter becomes our primary focus. We're driven by curiosity and the desire to make the world a better place. And, of course, some seek profit or hunger for or glory. But in any case, it's hard work. They might send you anywhere on a mission. We things have little place in the society. It's more for seasoned fighters. There are society lodges in many cities. The closest one is in Nerosian. They are each led by venture captains, so that's like me. The Grand Lodge is in Absalom, the center of the world. The Decemvirate sits there, the anonymous council of our leaders. No more questions. If you have any questions, come to me. I have to go. I'm gonna wait until I get a, a, a good luck. Watch your back, only trust your closest friends. The enemy is cunning and treacherous. Anyway! I don't know why. Uh, I'm gonna wait until I get a full party of people before I start um, thinking about the possibility of a mercenary. I don't like the idea of, you know, my story companions suffering or having to deal with experience stuff because I threw a mercenary in. I like the idea of just having four or five at the most until you recruit my next person, get as much experience as possible that way. Let's see here. Um, okay, well, we're coming back to the bar, so let's talk to Camellia again. Greetings! The neat smile on Camellia's lips disappears so quickly you almost wonder if you imagined it. Your speech tells me you're of noble birth. Camellia laughs her, Camellia laughs her practice musing laugh as she watches you from under lowered lashes. You're most insightful. A fine quality to have. Camellia's laughter ends, and unspoken words hang in the silence. <clears throat> Forgive me if my questions disturb you. I couldn't resist such a noble and beautiful lady. I'll stop bothering you immediately if talking to me upsets you. Not at all! Our conversation is an exquisite delight. Camellia affords you a brief, friendly smile and appreciation of your manners. I think that's really all I... Oh, nope, that's it. Okay, I have to go. We'll talk later. I won't keep you. The dawning smile on Camellia's face freezes and quickly dies away. Okay, and uh, speaking of Camellia, we got this one here. Orgus Worm. Here, take this. Yes, it's 2,000 gold coins. Take your payment and remember that... Damn it. I can't do gruff voices. <laughs> well... <laughs> Here, take this. Yes, it's 2,000 coins. Take your payment and remember that Horgus Worm always keeps his word. You helped me get back to the surface, and I duly paid you for escorting me. Now, speaking of our future cooperation... Horgus looks at you with unvarnished disapproval. His arms folded across his chest, his foot tapping impatiently. I have a job that would be perfect for someone like you. Naturally, I'll pay generously for your services. What do you mean, a job for someone like me? For an adventurer, I need to sell their soul for booze and then lie down drunk in the gutter. What do you think? You're somehow different. A traveling knight, perhaps, noble of heart, but without a coin to your name. 
Well, considering the money you just gave me, I don't think that applies to me anymore. Orga sizes you up critically, then size and trucks. You seem a reliable enough ally to me, and you did get me out of those mongrel caves, so... Why should I care what you do with my money once you got it? <laughs> Horgus Worm succeeded at a perception check. Horgus seems like one of those people who thinks the entire world owes him something. However, you hear notes of hysteria beneath his smug arrogance. It's as though he's really quite nervous, but taking great pains to conceal it. <coughs> Normal birth doesn't give you the right to behave badly. I would ask that you refrain from such statements in the future. Horgus puts his right hands on his hips. Oh, really? How impudent. No one dares help tell Horgus Worm how to address the rabble. Watch yourself, buddy. My book just might. So what does this job involve? You shall be my bodyguard. You see, I have good reason to return to my mansion here in Canabras. I still have... Well, it doesn't matter. It's none of your business. My mansion is a breathtaking building with a large garden in the wealthiest part of the city. Even before the team was attacked, every thief and fraudster in the city has tried to get inside, one way or another. I shudder to imagine the state it's in now. I have little hope that my guards were able to hold the mansion during the attack, and I expect that the servants fled when they saw the demons. Only Avatar knows what's happened there since... Therefore, I would ask that you meet me at my mansion and guard me, guard me there until I complete my business. <laughs> I already asked the local paladins for help, but they've no desire to set foot outside this tavern! Damn cowards and traitors. That's what they are. Yep, sure is cowardly to stay in your local base of operations in a city where there's none left. Also, please, do take Camellia with you. I trust that girl more than the rest of your gang. She is of noble birth, after all. What kind of war are we talking about? A thousand gold coins. Work is provided without hesitation. Oh boy. <laughs> Let me see if I can succeed where slandered failed. Double the reward, and I'll think about it. Yes! Got it! <laughs> Several tense moments pass in silence, then Horgus relaxes. Deal! Gained 30 experience. Deal! Marvelous! Most excellent! Horgus's face relaxes, smoothing a few of the tense lines. I'll proceed to my mansion at once and wait for you there. Meanwhile, you needn't worry. I know the city like the back of my hand. But do hurry, unless you want me to lower your reward. Uh, as far as I know in certain uh, in past playthroughs, he doesn't really lower the reward at all. I mean, even if you <clears throat> fail that check and only get a thousand gold, he'll still, you know, give it to you. <clears throat> Granted, of course, I wonder if he, he might uh, lower it if you don't go over there until after the, uh, whatever the hell this place is called, attack. <laughs> Defender's Heart. Um, but there are pla a couple places in future episodes I'm going to be prioritizing. Mainly due to the fact that there are a couple quests that actually do get affected by the passage of time, so. Okay. Here's Gemmel Hawks, the local barkeep, who just so happens to be a potion vendor of all things. <clears throat> Gemmel Hawks. A strange figure towers over the bar. A huge and gainly man with skin so milky white that his blue veins are visible even from a distance. His bald head is equal parts lumpy and pitted, and blood-filled eyes stare impassively out at you from beneath his pale brows. The glass in the albino's large clumsy hands looks dangerously delicate, as if one twitch of those callous fingers would be enough to crush it. A gold medallion engraved with a tankard gleams around his neck. Will it be? Lore religion check passed. The medallion you're wearing. It's a sacred symbol, isn't it? Are you a cleric of Caden Kalian? Five experience. I'm a tavern keeper. Best in the city. Best there's ever been. And I pray to the best god there is. Who are you? The albino slowly takes your measure with his red eyes and finding what the gentle eye says. Gemmel Hawks. Vampire. You really a vampire? Gemmel gives you a long look of reproach and then grudgingly, grudgingly enters. No. How did you end up in the Crusader City? How did anyone end up here? How did you? Or them? With a huge hand, the tavern keeper gestures at the ragtag group presentable in the Linda Room. The world is big, but still, there isn't a place for everyone. People no longer have a life anywhere else. They end up here. Any news in the city? 
The albino looks around. There are demons everywhere. And he showed up. Are there any places in the city worth visiting? You mean places that normal people usually stay well aware away from? And there are plenty. Like the Pataxian Wine Cellar. Gemmel pauses for effect, like the name of the place alone should make you quiver in fear. Once belonged to a Pataxian trading house, then King Aravetti came to power in Patax, and people started property started changing hands. <clears throat> Soon after, the seller's shop assistants was found in a ditch. Not all of them, mind you, just his head. Numerian gangsters had taken up possession of the place. They wanted to sell something stronger than wine on the street. And they ended up on the gallows. Then King Aravetti's number was up, so now the store stands, store stands empty and unclaimed. People say that a headless ghost wanders the place at night, moaning ghoulishly. <laughs> After coming to the end of a story, unusually long by his standards, a tavern keeper takes a swig from his anger. Just don't ask me how he makes any noise with no head. I wasn't there. I just tell it like I heard it. I see you're not one for talking. Gimbal gives you a long, mournful look and says nothing. <laughs> hey, right, show me a tip. Like I said, somewhat suitable for a barkeep, he is the potion vendor. And there are tons and tons of potions you can get. Uh, let's see here. He does have some other magic items, though. We have the Dark Veil, the Dark Omen, a small bag of holding. Very nice. You know what? I actually have enough money for this, which is nothing short of unheard of. I'm going to buy that right now. You. Now I can carry more shit. Hooray! <laughs> Alright. Just lots and lots of goodies. Oh, and here. Yes. Okay. There are recipes in this game. So here's the thing. You don't have to eat in Kingmaker. Like you did in Kingmaker, thank God. Because whoever thought it would be a great idea to make those rations so blasted expensive really didn't know how to make a game fun. <laughs> In that game, though, I think you did have recipes. And while you don't have to eat anything, the pe uh, the <laughs> recipes in this game are actually really helpful because they'll give you stat bonuses that'll last a really long time. Definitely, like, a great idea to rest up with some food uh, before you go to a dungeon. Because I think the bonuses last a full 24 hours, and some of them are just amazing. Really, really, really good stuff. Somehow it just actually boosts up your attack power and all that stuff. And then, of course, you have a lot of uh, cooking ingredients here. What is it? Prince Long Fat Bucks. Punch first cake kits. Just lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of potions. And then there's also the bottomless mug. A plus two bonus on saving throws against beer effects for one hour. Nice. <clears throat> oh, now check this out. When used by a monk with a drunken master archetype, the monk also restores one drunken key point and makes a monk's melee attacks deal an additional 1d8 damage, while his drunken power feature is active. That's amazing. Oh my god. And it's 3,000 goddamn dollars! <laughs> okay, whatever. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Well, I tell you what. If the devs finally ever get the... Drunken Master's alignment problems fixed. And lawful characters are still allowed to take it, which I kind of hope for, because, you know, just because a Drunken Master isn't necessarily lawful, to, and I don't think lawful monks can't take it. There's probably those that like the idea of not sauceing themselves up too much, but having, you know, a drink or two to really, you know, get themselves uh, livened up and ready to go. Also, I found an unholy signet. Oh, here it is. This spell, this thing that grants us were the ability to cast Bane spell as a third level cleric three times a day. Yes, please. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm already a partial cleric, so why the hell not? And what's really cool is with a is with a ring like that, I won't have to worry about learning. Uh, Scribing a Bane's uh, scroll to my spell list until I'm like, what, level 7? Or something? Or, or I reach level 4 spells or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, it depends on what the uh, caster effects are, but I'll look at that later. 
Oh, here, Jernog. <clears throat> a young man in well-worn traveling clothes, a simple wooden symbol of Aristil on his chest, is, is efficiently cutting a linen robe into strips to use his bandages. Despite his physical exhaustion, he works with zeal, singing some tune about red braids and ripe sheaves of wheat under his breath. He raises his warm chestnut colored eyes to you. Are you one of the Crusaders? Thank you for defending those of us whose talents lie off the battlefield. I'm Jernog, servant of Aristel. Pleased to meet you. <clears throat> what you doing? I only took my holy, holy orbs recently, so my god has only bestowed a little of his powers upon me as yet. I'm sorry to say that the number of wounded fighters in this tavern is far beyond my power to heal. But there's a reason people say, have faith in the gods, but look to yourself first. I may not be able to help the wounded with magic, but I can at least cut up bandages. You from around here? No, I was just passing through Canabras. I was sailing down that old manor. There's a great solid river to a village by the name of Tilly Creek. I happened to land in the city on the eve of the festival, and I'm ashamed to say I decided to stay for a day to enjoy myself. But I ended up staying in the city longer than I had bargained for. <clears throat> Tilly Creek, where's that? It's a small fishing village. It's not even marked on some maps, but people do live there. What they don't have is a priest. They have no one to heal their wounds, no one to offer prayers for a good catch, no one to give their dead a dignified burial. And the world wound is a stone's throw away, so I'll be setting sail for Tilly Creeks to serve my god and my people. Uh, he must be. Once we all can offer, I'll be going there. If by the grace of the god, uh, good gods we all survive this, you should come with me and visit sometime. You'll find a village here on the bank of the river. There's actually a really cool quest there involving hags, so definitely worth a visit. Aren't you a young and experienced cleric, afraid to go to the border of the world one? <coughs> I won't lie. I am afraid, but what can I do? Those villagers are simple people. Every day of their short life is spent doing hard, honest work. It's exactly the kind of life I want. Something simple, but meaningful. If I had centuries ahead of me, like elves do, I might have spared some 50 years or so to travel around the world, the young man says with a smile. Or maybe even a hundred, why not? But I don't have time to spare, so I want to spend my short life in the place where I'm needed most. Even if it's dangerous. Especially if it's dangerous. I could use the help of a cleric. Jernog makes a helpless gesture. Eric still knows I'd be glad to help you, but it's no use. My spells are depleted, and I have no training in potions or squirrels. See this robe I'm coming up for bandages? It's the second to last one! After. <clears throat> May still have watch over you. Yeah, I worship a different god, but whatever. Thank you for the love nonetheless. Okay, and I think there is one more character up here that's worth talking to, and we'll go ahead and get her next. Here she is, Anivia. Anivia, in her muted colors, blends almost perfectly into the background. She appears relaxed, but her seemingly unfocused eyes are taking in everything around her, striking and filtering potential threats. The only tell is the way she drums her fingers on her hip near her weapon teeth. She shows no signs of her injuries and confidently leans on her previously broken leg. She pretends to have just noticed you, even though she watched you from a from afar. Oh, hey! See how they pass me up? Now I can run, jump, or dance a jig if I feel like it. Any suspicious places in the city as I paid attention to? There were a couple spots I wanted to check out, but I didn't have time. If there really is a den of cults, is there? It would be good if you could swoop in in there and bust some heads. You don't even need a search warrant. Anivia shoots you a crooked smile. First one is the Silken Thread. It's a funny little tailor shop that doesn't take any orders and never buys any fabric, but they always seem oh so busy. They're busy with something in there, all right, but so an eight. <clears throat> Silken Thread Atelier. Ah, they took their name from a popular anime gaming series. Second one is the Alchemy Shop, Topaz Solutions, and they trade in everything, not just healing potions. Judging by the ingredients they've been buying on the black market, there's something fishy about the alchemical rituals going down in that place. Tell me about yourself. She shrugs with a lazy smile. I'd be happy to, but there's kind of nothing to tell. What's so interesting about me? Where are you from? Nowhere. I was blown in by the wind and found in a cabbage patch. <laughs> uh, sorry, that's an old habit of mine. I don't like blabbing about my past, but you saved my skin, so I guess I kind of owe it to you not to clown around, right? I'm from Nadal, and I wouldn't wish my homeland on the worst enemy. You've heard of the place, I'm sure. Ruled by monsters that aren't alive nor dead, and the official religion is the cult of Zonkathon. I grew up in a slum like a weed between the cobblestones. 
I didn't have a dad, but I've had lots of aunts and uncles. My mom's cronies. No prize for guessing the kind of business she was involved in. They gave me a set of lockpicks as soon as I could hold a spoon, and while other kids were picking their noses, I was picking pockets. Considering the religion I have, I'm kind of glad I kept my business to myself when we first met. <laughs> when I was 12, the monks of the Silent Shroud came for us. Creepy guys with their mouths sewn shut. They're the guards in Nisrar. Mom gave me to her friends, and we hid in a secret temple of Desna. I never saw my mom again. I lay low in a temple for the next few years, kept my head down. I washed floors, fetched water, listened to sermons. Funny thing, after a while, I started liking Desna's teachings. But as soon as I was old enough, I was out of there. I had left in a doll and got as far away as I could. <laughs> Hello! Sis! Uh, fun fact, the first character I played in this game was an atheist. So, I don't really know a lot in terms of, uh, religion. Please don't kill me for saying this. You shouldn't be afraid of Zonkathon. The Midnight Lord brings his faithful the gift of freedom and joy. Of a sort. Anivia casts you a sidelong look. Aw, shucks, thanks, but I think I can get by just fine without any of your little gifts. Quite a ragtag group you got here. From nobles to street thieves. You got that right. <laughs> Only the best for you! What do you do if the knights and nobles fail to save the world? The low lives are our only hope. How'd you meet Erebeth? I was bumming around time in a while back, doing this and that. Desden temples sometimes gave me odd jobs. You know, sometimes they needed people with skills like mine. On the surface, it was fine, I guess. After Nadal, the freedom of River Kingdom should have seemed like heaven. My chance to sit back and enjoy life. But I wasn't happy. There just wasn't any joy in my new life. I was all alone. No one cared about me, and I didn't care about anybody either. I struggled to find a reason to drag myself out of bed every morning. Tying a stone around my neck and jumping into the nearest river started to look pretty appealing. One day, I was hired to follow some fellas to who the local authorities suspected were Razmir and spies. I've never really paid attention to this uh, phrase before, but with the D DLC out, this takes on a whole new meaning. I was stupid. I made a rookie mistake, and they me. It's like my body had already decided to do what my mind had been fighting. It's finally put me out of my misery. Get someone else to kill me, since I didn't have the guts to do it myself. They grabbed me. I thought they got me on the spot, but instead they hogtied me and dragged me off. And Just like an animal going to slaughter, my only thought was, let's get this over with. They brought me to their stinking cave, threw me on their altar, and I realized who it was. Kuthites! From Nidal! They tracked me down after all those years! I didn't care anymore. Wouldn't even have cared if they'd eaten me or whatever. We all gotta go sometime, right? So I was lying there, staring at those knives pointed at me when Pete rolled the dice, and I got a nat 20. I mean, I hit the jackpot. Here, Beth! There she was, storming into the cave. Picture it. I'm lying on an altar with all these knife filled maniacs around me, and suddenly Erebeth storms in! I thought it was Iomade herself! Fierce in her shining armor with her gleaming sword rays, she made quick work of those scumbags, chopped them up just like that. I didn't even have time to blink! She untied me, and then. Anivia's face lights up as she chuckles. She looked through the papers they had on the table, and she started swearing like a sailor! <laughs> so much for Iomade! How did you and Erebeth end up in Canopus? After almost becoming a human sacrifice, I knew I never wanted to leave Erebeth's side. Desna knows I fell for her instantly, and I fell hard. My misery was gone, and when Erebeth showed me what was in those papers, proof that the cultists had a nest in her home city, I offered to help without a second thought! Anivia smiles warmly. She must have figured I couldn't wait to get my revenge on the cultists, but I didn't give a damn about them. It was her! I'd go anywhere with her. Even on a crusade, or into the jaws of a dragon. But I took to life in Canaveras like a duck to water. I used to be an outcast wherever I went, but half the crusaders are the same. After all, who'd volunteer to tangle with demons on the edge of the abyss? You gotta either be either a goody two-shoes with too much honor and free time, or a misfit with no life out there in a normal world with normal people. People come here to run away from their debts, their pasts, they're from themselves, so I fit right in. What's it like living with Erebeth? 
It's like living. Without her, I wouldn't be. Seriously, if I were alone, I'd definitely be gone by now. Sure, sometimes we argue, can't deny that. Sometimes we bang our fists on the table and yell so loud that the walls shake, but that's all about order business. But at home, well, I'll give you an example. I kind of always wanted to move out of that broom closet we call a house and into somewhere cozier. It ain't like they take a vow of poverty at the evil Eagle Watch. But every month, somehow, most of our spare money is spent on Crusader business. Sure, I get bad mad about it, but... Anemia makes a helpless gesture. It's part of why I love her so much. You know, Erebeth has that thing that matters most for a person. A purpose in life. She's always got a reason for whatever she's doing. Her whole life is a crusade. And I... I just drifted around like a leaf in the wind until Desna brought us together. Now she's the meaning of my life. So it really makes no difference if we live in a mansion or under a bush. Thank you for your answers. Thanks for asking. Playing all this kind of makes me feel better. What are your responsibilities in the Eagle Watch? Anivia smiles peacefully. Nothing official. I'm not even a knight, you know. I just hang around. You sure you want to know the details? Catching traitors and spies and cultists is no walk in the park. It's a delicate job. You can't always do it all within the letter of the law. But what if we surprise some suspicious blighter with an official search? Everyone will know about it before long, starting with their cronies. And again, sneaking into people's houses at night ain't exactly legal. Crusaders can't be doing stuff like that, can they? Well, not exactly at night. She trails off. I have to go. Alright, watch yourself now. Do 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 do. Alright. I take care of, I think. Let's see, we have one more person over here before we go downstairs. Uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna run over here. And oh, what's in this box? Food! And ingredients. I'll take them. Nobody cares. Let's talk to this old guy named Forn Autumn Hayes. Forn Autumn Hayes. A tall, fragile-looking elf sits in front of you, eyes closed. He is pale as a ghost, his arm wrapped in a blood-stained bandage. He spotted other bandages on his body under his clothes, but even in such a miserable state, he manages to keep calm. Raising his eyes to meet yours, he says faintly, I am Thorn Autumn Hayes, at your service. His pale lips are reddened by blood, but you see no signs of pain or fear in his eyes. <laughs> Do you need help? After giving you a cold, intense look, he shakes his head. Do not trouble yourself on my behalf. A local healer tended to me. Besides, I come from a resilient, hardy people. My body will endure both the wounds and the poison delivered through them. Who are you? My name is Foreign Autumn Hayes. I come here from Kionin because I am a hunter, and all my minions of evil are quarry. All minions of evil are my quarry. I won't say more than that if you don't mind. We are strangers and of different races and cultures. I'd rather not tell you more than is necessary. Who wounded you? A sinner and an accomplice to demons. The quarry I am hunting in this inhospitable place. I'm Shadowheart. You can trust me. I might be able to help you. After a brief pause, Forn says, It would be impolite to refuse such a direction from the offer. Who is your core here in Mindev? I was hunting a fugitive, a Descarite by the name of Kalesa. Pains me to admit that there are heinous malefactors such as her among my noble kind. I managed to catch up to her in Canopus and I wounded her. Then demons appeared and the city was engulfed in flames. I was injured in a battle, at sued, and couldn't free her soul from its service to her dark masters. He expresses no anger or hatred as he speaks, only compassion and sorrow. <clears throat> You're not that great of a hunter, it would seem. His expression remains indifferent, but his voice is cold as a mountain street. Many underestimate the wisdom and experience that my people acquire over the centuries. I do hope that my opponent will misjudge me as you have. What's to aid in your hunts? <laughs> Foreign covers his eyes wearily. I thank you, but this is my mission, and I'm used to facing all manner of terrors on my own. I do appreciate your willingness to help. If you happen to meet Kalesa, take, take take caution. She has turned many innocent souls to the path of evil, and darkness has rewarded her with many gifts. 
Her appearance alone will tell you that. It is warped. The agitated skin, the malicious stare of her blood red eyes, the beast of teeth. She's more monster at this point. Oh boy. What does this Kayla look like again? Eh, shit, I didn't think so. Her skin is dark, her hair preternaturally white, her red eyes can see perfectly in the dark, which to my dismay, I have come to know from experience. But bright light caused her kind of pain. They used an alchemical powder that explodes in a dazzling flash, and she cried out as if I had stabbed her. It's clear that this, this woman is a faithful servant of darkness. The marks that Kayla's masters have left on her appearance say as much. I'd like to know more about you. I won't hold anything back. Not who I am, why I made my way here, or who it is that I'm pursuing. Tell me more about yourself. Other people tend to believe that identity is the sum of a person's actions and events that happen to them. For them, I am one of a long line of warriors of Kionin who, since his youth, has dedicated himself to hunting evil and injustice. For them, I am a successful and palpable huntsman who had tracked down and slain a great many monsters. But I am an elf, and for me, my identity has a different meaning. It is shaped by the place where I was born that I love so deeply. I am shaped by what I find beautiful and what makes my heart quicken. By the fears that come to me in the dead of night. By the things I find so intolerable that at the sight of them, my very core darkens and fills with poison. Thus, to tell you who I am, I would require many days and much candor. That's more than you and I have at our disposal. Why'd you choose to be a hunter of evil? Because I am the son of a noble and proud nation. We are sometimes criticized for our arrogance, but no one dares doubt our honor. When a crime is committed, we cannot turn a blind eye. If we were to abandon our obligation to oppose evil, if we were to surrender this obligation to other races, we would also relinquish our preeminence. <laughs> Remind me, who was the quarry that brought you to Mendev? I was hunting a fugitive, a Descarite, a Descarite by the name of Kilesa. It pains me to admit that there are heinous malefactors such as her among my noble kind. Fresh my memory. That miscreant, unfortunately, is one of the elven race. In the blessed state of Kionin, she swore herself to the faith of Descari, and set out on her on criminal path in his name. Darkness rewarded her with great powers and repulsive disfigurement, since she could no longer hide her sins. Kalesa fled here to be closer to her master, and I followed her. I have no more questions. I wish I have to go. Good fortune to you. And yeah, that'll be a quest later on. There's quite a few ways uh, that you can uh, end it. As you'll see later on in the game. I've actually taken it to, all the way to its end once. I'm kind of curious if uh, ending it early gives me some sort of uh, other benefit. Okay, now. Ah, yes, this guy right here. Surrender thy soul, Delvin! I only take protectors! again! How many times is that today? Take your jokes and shove them, Tiefling. Whoa, easy there, Teeth. Don't hit me. He didn't try to hit you, he's... <laughs> I tell you what, anybody that can pull that off is pretty fun in my book. I'm gonna do a little bit of looting before I talk to him, though. Okay, so. And then, of course, over here is quite interesting puzzle. There's another way outside that I'll take. Maybe later. Um, oh! <clears throat> Roll three success. We have a wand of acid. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. Okay. So there's three switches in this room. One here, one here, and one here. <laughs> Flip them all in the correct order. Hit the shield, and you win a prize. Or at least open a secret area. If the order's not correct, uh, okay, never mind. Loot. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Oh, here, here we go. Yeah, it's a button. Okay, so if I remember correctly, let's see. We I think we take this down. That's up, and then this one is. Up. Okay, I think that's right. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay, let's try down, down, and up. Nope. 
Uh, hold them down. Nope. Okay, let's see here. Um, one, uh, that one up and the other side. There we go, we got it. Okay. Good old trial and error. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Looting in here, we get uh, a yellow letter. I uh, think that's worth reading. A fine feather and a silver ink ball. Collect them all. And in the treasure chest, we have a rare helmet. <laughs> four scrolls of magic missile. Why in the world we have one? I don't know, but Nenio will be happy. So, uh, scroll of shield. Scroll of mage armor. Post of restoration lesser. And some elemental glasses. There we go. Let's see. Um, did I? Nope, I didn't think so. <laughs> I mean, my knowledge oh, arcane is kind of garbage. So. <laughs> All right. If I can find the, uh, a way to kind of get that trained up, I'd love to. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and pick up some stuff here, and I'll be sure to sell some of this stuff. Use a light hammer. <clears throat> okay. And now we'll talk to this guy. Hey, Chief! Ooh, hey, gorgeous. Come over here. I want to talk to you about something. Something really important. I am genuinely baffled that they didn't give him a romance. You can mod one in if you want, but I'm not going to worry about it. The young tiefling sits cross-legged on the floor. He looks relatively calm for someone in shackles, but his tail whips back and forth in agitation. Noticing your attention, he tiefling sits up and beckons you over. Quit bothering the decent people in here, Wolgif, or I'll knock your teeth out! <laughs> What's it to you, Delvin Dum Dum? You were told to guard me, and I'm not stopping you. But no one told me I had to shut my trap. Who are you? Wolgif. Wolgif Jeffdo. I deal in useful things. I can get you whatever you want. Anything. But there's just one problem. <laughs> the tiefling rattles his chains and gives you a meaningful look. What do you want from me? I'll lay it out for you. Simple job, 30 minutes tops. We go someplace, talk to someone, and in return, whatever you want, I'll get it for you. Some extra rations, no problem. Armor, weapons, scrolls, you name it. It's as good as yours. If you need my help with something, whistle and I'll be there. I'm handy enough with knives, too, and even my magic know-how isn't too shabby. He actually does become something of a vendor, so yeah, definitely worth having in your party if you want. <laughs> what a load of guff! If you were good at magic, you wouldn't be stuck in here now, would you? If he wasn't good at magic, you probably wouldn't be so gullible, would you? Don't you listen to him, Chief. He'd find fault with the Queen herself. I'll be useful to have in battle, and I'll sell whatever you want at a reasonable price. It's your lucky day. You won't meet another gem like me in Canabras. Why are you in chains? Does it really matter? Don't get hung up on the past, Chief. Don't look to the future. Live in the here and now. He was caught thieving. <laughs> Your shadow, what was that? <laughs> get me out of here and I'll tell you. And don't worry, it's not contagious. His, the, this character and his voice work just fit hand in glove. I love it. I can't help you while you're chained up here. How can I free you? That's easy. You know Irabeth? Feisty looking gal, always wears armor. You can't miss her. She's the meanest fighter in the whole city. When you see her, put in a good word for me, will ya? Tell her there's this guy, Wolgif, locked up for no good reason in the Defender's heart. Well, for the follies of his youth. And he really wants to get out on bail so he can keep up his good behavior and make a contribution to society. You got that? Will you do it? All right, I'll talk to you, Beth, about your situation. <laughs> I knew I could count on you. Knew it the moment I laid eyes on you. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, as someone who follows the Prince of Darkness, she wouldn't have too much issue with a thief in her party. <laughs> Not to mention one that can get her useful items. To help her in her quests. Um, but anyway, last person up here to talk, Irabeth. Uh, before we do, let's loot this. Let's look! Hylor and the Spear of Nightmares! Wow, nice. Irabeth. Irabeth rubs her red and tired eyes. Any success? How's the city? 
Uh, there's a tiefling chained up in a defender's heart. I say that as though I'm not in a building. What can you tell me about him? Arabeth shrugs scornfully. What if is a petty thief from a gang of thieflings operating in Canabras? That's what we call them in these parts. He tried to rob a vendor of magical items recently. Unfortunately, we apprehended only one of them, and the rest managed to escape. We have nowhere else to keep him apart from the defender's heart, but that's hardly a prison. Wolchif knows it too. He's been begging us for days to let him go free or have someone vouch for him. He's already asked you to put in a good forward for him, hasn't he? Arabeth going at you thoughtfully in the trucks. If you want to recruit Wolchif and put him to good use, go ahead and take him off our guard's hands. We can all afford to let a soldier spend their days watching over a middling thief. I hope the tiefling proves useful, should she decide to take him along. What is our main objective? You heard what that demon said. They're gonna desecrate the wardstone and blow up the whole barrier around the world wound. That would be an even worse disaster than the war wound's expansion before the Second Crusade. Not only Canabras, but every city with a wardstone will be destroyed, including the capital. We cannot allow that no matter what. We will retake it, even destroy it if we must. Naomide's gift must not become a weapon of the Abyss. <laughs> I'm sorry you told me that in the last episode, but it's fine. These warstones, what are they? They are our greatest treasure, the shield given to us by Ayamade herself, and placed in Canabras and other Mandevian cities and fortresses by her herald. The chains of warstones form a protective barrier that stops the expansion of the world wound and keeps the demons from moving beyond its borders. I shudder to think what will happen if that barrier falls. Let me ask a few personal questions. <coughs> Frowning a little, Arabeth nods. Please, but I was warn you, there are some things I don't have the right to discuss. Where are you from? I was born in Canabras. I grew up on a farm just outside it. But my way back home lay at the end of a long and winding war road. It took me years of traveling through foreign lands before I came to be where I've always belonged. I had to become a paladin. A bitter smile appears in half orcs face. I don't much like to remember it. Believe it or not, the story of how I became a paladin is also the story of how I failed to become a knight. My parents were crusaders. May their souls stand together in Ayamade's celestial army. When I was born, they had retired from the war and started preparing me to continue their legacy. But my father was an orc. He'd be pressed to find a calmer, wiser, and more pious servant of the goddess than he. But still, all his life, he was dogged by sideways looks and whispers. When I grew older and it was time for me to serve, I decided, anywhere but Canabras. That was where my father had served loyally, and his only reward had been injustice. Besides, the witch hunters, led by the honorable prelate Holrun, stalked the city with a heavy hand. Who knows what they'd have done to a strange girl with a strange girl with green skin? Instead, I went to a smirk that looks more like a painful grimace crosses her face. You can laugh if you want, but I was young and foolish. I chose Last Wall, of all places. You can imagine how well I was accepted in a country that's been battling the orcs of Belkson since its foundation. There are many things there, like me, but we were all treated as second-class citizens. To the locals, my green skin was worse than leper scabs. Even my brothers in faith kept their distance. They took my vows, and the goddess granted me the powers of paladin. But then, not a single order would accept me into their ranks. I spent another six months knocking on doors before I realized the simple truth. I serve Iomade, not these people. I don't have to prostrate myself before them. So I, I left, as a paladin, but not as a knight. Things are bound to be tough for your kind, too. You belong to two different races, but neither is willing to embrace you as one of their own. But at least relations between humans and elves aren't poisoned by centuries of mutual hatred. Some really good reactivity I she has there. How did you come to join the Knight of the Order? I left Last Wall and went traveling. The goddess guided me, and my path led me to where atrocities were happening. I often fought in exchange for gold, but never for unworthy aims, of course. I wandered, wandered the River Kingdoms for a few years, killing monsters and tracking down criminals. Sometimes I thought I was just wasting time, that my true place was in Canabras, but I pushed those thoughts away. I didn't even want to think about going back. But in the end, Divine Providence had brought me to my senses. It happened in Tymon. 
I was tracking a gang of bandits, where my employer suspected was a cover for Rasmir's spies. I managed to find their lair, but inside I found something far more dangerous than spies. An unholy temple to Zong Kuthan. When I broke in there, the cultists were about to sacrifice someone. The person who was destined to become my wife, Anivia. But that's another story. After I cut down the cultists, I examined her papers and couldn't believe my eyes. A network of evil cults had spread through all of Abistan, including Mendev. Worse, the documents clearly showed that their allies, the Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth, had infested my native Canabras and were even among the ranks of the Paladins. After that, delaying my homecoming would be tantamount to desertion. Luckily, I was no longer alone. Anivia was as eager to destroy the cultists as I was. Anivia and I hurried to Canabras. We couldn't trust anyone. The papers indicated that the cults had infiltrated everything. Luckily, I had some experience in investigation, and my beloved... The half-orc smiles warmly. She knew her way around working locks, tailing people, and trading information with the city's bottom feeders. Soon, we defeated... Well, alas, not the whole Hydra, but a few of its heads. Do you know who turned out to be the leader of the cultists? The commander of the Eagle Watch! Can you imagine? While Prelate Holvern was chasing witches through the city, the enemy had infiltrated the very order responsible for internal security. The scandal reached the ears of the Queen. At first she planned to disband the order in disgrace, but then she offered its command to me and put its salvation in my hands. Of course, there was one small catch. I wasn't a knight. But I was made commander just the same, skipping the usual progression through the ranks. <coughs> Lore, religion, check pass. I can't imagine the followers of Zonkuthan in alliance with demon worshippers. Shouldn't they hate each other? They should, but Baphomet's minions are masters of deception. They manipulate Zonkuthan's butchers as eagerly as Iomedes' knights. The cultists from that unholy temple didn't know the true face of their associates in Canabras. We ourselves learned the truth much later, after getting to the bottom of their nest. How did the people of Canabras feel about your background? He tolerated it surprisingly well. I shouldn't have been so wary. Crusaders don't tend to be prejudiced as a rule. After all, heroes from all over the world, even from other continents, come here to fight the demons. Apparently, the people were only suspicious of full-blooded orcs. There are already many like me here, and we don't have any problems. All the locals do have their superstitions. Mendev is as merciless as last wall. They just have a different set of victims. I kept seeing those same sideways looks and scowls hearing the familiar whispers, but where once they used to whisper behind my back and point at me, now they whisper in my ear and point at someone else. So strange, to be on the other side of humiliation, to wipe the spit from your face and suddenly be invited to change position and spit at someone else. You must have figured out by now that I'm talking about tieflings. It's true, there are many of them among the cultists and few among our crusaders, and our fighters do all they can to drive away those who would be our allies. People send them, call them a Relu spawn, or worse. As if they chose to be born like that. I believe it's quite a feat to rise against the call of one's blood and join the forces of good. Still, most only see them as the enemy. I once saw a knight bleeding to death because he wouldn't let a tiefling priest touch his wound. Alas, I haven't been able to change this at all my time in Canopus. Tell me about Anivia. We met in Tymon, and was when I was wandering aimlessly from one ordeal to another. We returned to Canabras together to expose the temples of Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth. The day the Queen knighted me was the second happiest day of my life. The first was the day of our wedding. But Anivia isn't just my beloved. She's my staunchest ally. We share every victory and defeat. The best of me is alive thanks to her. Thank you for saving her back then, the day Canabras fell. Before her return, the only thing giving me the strength to protect the defender's heart was the hope that I'd see her again. We're in your debt. Thank you for your answers. Arabeth nods without saying a word. Tell me about the Eagle Watch. It was a small order created to fight not only demons, but also the enemy within. To maintain the purity of the paladin ranks, prevent heresy, and identify spies. And it failed miserably at that. The Temples of Life. Templars of the Ivory Labyrinth infiltrated it and formed their nest within its ranks. After the Queen entrusted me with leading the Order, Anivia and I practically built it from scratch. We got rid of dead weight, people weren't committed, we organized ways to transmit messages and orders safely. We introduced reliable ciphers. We found tacit allies around the city, from Crusader Orders to Street Beggars. 
this was my personal crusade to purge the city of the Templars who invested it. And I thought it was winning. I could feel it. We were so close to driving the cults out of Canabras, but Erebeth frowns. It's hard to admit that those successes didn't count for much once the demons entered the city. Success. <laughs> when we got up to the surface, there were more cultists in the city than crusaders. What exactly was, what was your order doing? Erebeth lowers her head. We did all we could. But it wasn't enough. The cultists were everywhere from the start, and the demons just raised everything to the ground despite our efforts. I have to go. Go. May I Amade keep you safe? Okay. So, with pretty much everybody up here talked to, I'm gonna run downstairs and pick up Wolzif, and I'll see you there. I like how you can hear a muffled uh, version of the song, by the way, from the basement. But anyway, uh, let's see. We'll talk to Delvin here. Go ahead. Don't take too long, though. Never mind. Well, Chief, what do you got for me? I talked to Erebeth, and I decided to make you part of my troop. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> you must be a smooth talker. Come on, Delvin. Get these bracelets of yours off me. I'm going free. You're sure to regret this. This tiefling will fleece you for everything you've got. Mark my words. Whatever, dude. You're a bitter little man, Delvin. Petty and mean. <laughs> you can't even be happy for me, can you? I pity you. I'll leave you alone with your sad little soul. So God. long. God, he's just so much fun. I love it. And now, Chief, straight down to business. <clears throat> you see, I'm one of those guys that people around here call thieflings. We just call ourselves the family. After we knocked over that shop and I got stuck here in the Defender's Heart, a little bird told me that Big Sister Karis may wanted to see me. That she had some questions to ask me. You following? Now, she won't be asking me questions like, Wolgif, how'd you manage to get out of this one? Or, Wolgif, you're so thin, didn't they feed you? No, something serious <laughs> has gone down and I just know they want to try to pin something on me. I can feel it in my tail. So, I knew right away that I couldn't go alone. You turned up just in time, Chief. You don't need to do anything when we get there. Just stand behind me and look mean, and I'll handle the rest. Somehow. Let's go. I'll, I'll show you the way. Oh, man. Well, if you're freaking awesome. Okay. <laughs> Okay, with that, we're gonna go to the, uh, tavern. And might as well save the game since I got him out of prison. And I'm gonna run outside and talk to just a couple more people. And then we'll be done. And here we are, outside Defender's Heart. This place has been sanctified. It can protect the area around it from the corruption of the abyss. So, <clears throat> as you wander through the uh, realm, you'll gather corruption as you rest, just out in the areas. I think even in the city proper. But if you come to a place like this, you'll clear it off instantly. And you'll want to do that because too much corruption can have some very nasty side effects. Okay, now, I'm going to go ahead over here and... Ah, oh, yes, this is... <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> Look what we got here! Are you too mad? Whatever possessed you to steal the gem golem from the Tower of Esther Museum? Explain yourselves. We didn't steal nothing, Commander. We saw some looters trying to get down the street and were captured. Now the shiny fellows are trophy by rights. That shiny fellow belongs to the treasury. The MA alone is worth more than the castle. Oh, I really don't like the idea of leaving this thing on. Whatever, though. Jordan, see if that no one needs so much a finger to go and propose to them. Seeing it goes to you two. You need to guard this fellow. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Ugh, they made that go to way too fast. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so that golem is known as the Prestidigit Painter. Because, you know, nothing nothing uh, makes such a, a more fun name than taking Prestidigitation and making words out of it. 
But it's basically a golem that allows you to, I think, change the color of your inventory and maybe even um, the appearance altogether. I don't know. Let me check. This is major. The magnificent and glittering golem, encrusted with gems and covered in intricate flowering embossing, triumphantly exclaims. Exclaims. Happy to be of service! May Selen brighten and vivify your day! What are you? I am a prestigious painter golem. Many millennia ago, I was built by Aslanti clerics of Selen, the goddess of beauty, to make the world a better place. In my joyful service, I have visited many lands, and for the past few centuries, I have resided at the Temple of the Sunrise Chrysanthemums in Tianjia. But then the good cleric saw me fit to offer me as a gift to the Mendevian Crusader so that you could share in the beauty that I can create. Can you uh, do anything useful? My creators granted me the ability to place illusions on various items. I can change their color and texture to make them more beautiful and appealing to the eye. Would you like me to cast an illusion over your armor to make it green? Green is a very pleasant color and it would match your eyes. My eyes are blue, dipshit. How'd you end up here? I was in the Tower of Estrid Museum, but then some not beautiful people came and started smashing everything. I asked them to show restraint, and that's when they decided to steal me. After all, I am beautiful. I'm very valuable. They dragged me down the street, but I didn't want to go with them, so I kept stopping. This least beautiful of my kidnappers threw me over his shoulder and tried to run away with me, but I am very heavy, so his back made a very not beautiful crunching <laughs> Oh my god. Man, it's so much fun. He started yelling, and then everyone else started yelling, and some of that yelling was directed at me, and then they started hitting me with their not beautiful weapons. And then some good crusaders drove them away and brought me here. Now I've been lumbered with you. Waste of good metal you are. Instead of working, I'm supposed to keep an eye on you so no one is tempted by the walking treasure trove. Come on, man, you can still work. Uh, what can you do to help the war effort? I was not designed for any type of combat, yet I can bring beauty and harmony to any type of combat. So, you're basically a weapon skin vendor, except you're free of charge. Okay. Um, happy to be of service. So, I've never actually used this guy before, and I don't know if I'll use again. So, okay. So, select an item change appearance and next item change first appearance from. So, what this basically lets me do. This is the item that's going to get changed. And then I put the transferring item here, and this will basically become that item. I don't really have anything I want to work on right now, so I'm not going to worry about this. So. Okay. Uh, and with that, we're going to talk to Joran Vane. <clears throat> A grizzled dwarf turns a blade in his callous hands, carefully inspecting his edge. When he sees you approaching, he sets the blade aside and greets you with a nod. New face in the city. Picks a good time to come to Canabras. As you can see, you weren't sore need of warriors. <laughs> Do you know everyone in Canaveras by sight? Well, not everyone, but I make it my business to know those people who might need my services. A blacksmith's work isn't just at the anvil, you know. Are you Sutton Vane's brother? Yep. Where he goes, I go. That's how we've always done it, even before the world wound. I forge the armor, he goes in the battle and breaks it. He brings it back to me, and I repair it and make it better than it before. Everything's changed since then, of course, but that part has stayed the same. How is Dalton to blame for the fall of Dresden? I've told this story so many times already. Well, telling it one more time won't kill me. The blacksmith sighs. Dresden was built after the First Crusade, back when it seemed like victory was ours for the taking, and the demon invasion would soon be at an end. The population of Old Sarkoris was thoroughly diminished, and many of them hoped to see their hard fighting, re hard fighting repaid with a small plot of unclaimed land. Dresden was a fortress built on all our hopes, and on Mendev's amb ambitions, though you're not supposed to say that out loud. What a city it was, Shadowheart. I can't even imagine. It was built by the finest engineers from the Five Kings Mountains. Queen Godfrey spared no expense. Dresden was meant to be the capital of the Crusade movement. A monument to its glory and a beacon of hope for all Glarian. Heroes were drawn there to seek fame and glory, and they came from all over. Haldor, Garun, Tianjia, I could list them all. A relic known as the Sword of Valor was kept there. The 
banner that has been carried about by Amade herself back when she was still human. That banner protected the city and kept the demons from teleporting inside its walls. As long as the banner was in its place, Dresden was invincible. Or so we thought. But then the world wound suddenly expanded. The demons launched a new onslaught and folks started saying it was time to declare the Second Crusade. Dresden was unassailable. Until one young officer was tempted by a beautiful woman. To convince him that the banner shouldn't be hanging in the city. That's rightful place was on the battlefield. She whispered honey words about glory and valor and convinced him that he could be a hero as great as Iomide herself. And the poor fool believed her. Rounded up some of his hot-headed friends and carried the banner outside the city gates on an unauthorized foray. The demon slaughtered them within seconds, but for some reason the courageous ringleader was spared. The whole army teleported into Dresden. It was a bloodbath. Jorn solemnly shakes his head. As you can guess, the officer was called Staunton Fane, and the woman turned out to be a demon. Not just any demon, it was Monaco, foul wretch. She's given us a lot of grief here in Canabras, too. Just don't ask me what I was doing while my brother was off having trysts with that beast. And why I didn't save him from his own stupidity. The blacksmith gestures as if to ward off the inevitable reprobation. Who could have guessed it would have ended like this? I failed my brother, that's the truth. I blame myself every day, looking at his plight. So, that's the story. Why do you have your forge here in the tavern yard? Wherever I am, that's where my forge is. A true master of any craft will always find the tools in need. There's no forge. Of course, it's now just a pile of charred stone and metal. But, I still got my hands, and that means I can work. So, Radiant Storm, do you recognize the sword? Do I recognize it? <laughs> of course I do. I made this with my own hands. There's my brand, see? The dwarf carefully takes the sword in his hands, gazing at it like a doting father. Oh, Yaniel, things have been tough without you. But at least we still got your sword. That's something. Jorn returns the sword to you. In battle, ordinary swords get blunted, they break, but sometimes a weapon can per preserve. I don't even know how to explain it. I'm no authority on these things, but something like an of the deeds done with that weapon, or more like the reflection of the wielder's soul? I, I don't know. I will say one thing. Take care of that sword. The annual may no longer be with us, but the demons will still remember why they need to turn tail and run when they see Radiance. Ugh, scabbards all worn. Can't be having a fine sword like this being carried around, this tatty thing. I'll make you a new one, if you like. The city stands strong, we both survive. Come see me again, and I'll have it ready. No charge. Show me your wares, and this is pretty much your equipment person. Has a lot of useful items. I don't know if I'm gonna buy anything right now. Things are just really, really stupid expensive here, so not really a lot you can get right from the get-go. But I know I don't need these. I think it's a safe bet I don't need those either. On the nearest team mail, so. Uh, and then, of course, we have the headband of Luring Charisma, which just got identified, so. I don't really. Let's see here. Let me get rid of those. I. Mm. Let's see. Get rid of the Um. Let's see here. Okay, we'll get rid of you. You. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'll, uh... <clears throat> Here. Oh, damn. Yeah, clicking on these things is a little bit of a finicky. If you sure. Uh, let's see. I'll keep these. You might be super useful. Uh, let's see here. Keep one of those. Just, you know, whatever I feel like keeping that might be uh, something for someone else to use. And, of course, we'll go ahead and make a deal. So, yeah. Hooray! I'm kind of sort of rich <laughs> But, yeah, you can get just about every type of weapon in the game. And, um, yeah. Okay.
Alright, well, at that point, I think that's pretty much everyone we can talk to, so that's gonna go ahead and be an episode. A long one for sure, but one definitely fun to do, just in terms of learning about the city and its lore for the most part. So, yeah. That's gonna be it for me, uh, for now. When we can next come back, I will start exploring the city and slowly working my way back towards the Grey Garrison. But in the meantime, thank you guys so much for watching, and I do hope to see you in the next one. Until then, take care of yourself.